Quay, again, I ask you, what is Tom Paris's game? What's he up to? This is no good for this guy to I be doing know. such things. This is, he's he's clearly he's clearly saving up doing like wedding band ring rules to save up for a present for someone, announcing it in front of her, her boyfriend. He gives her the gift and doesn't seem to have anything uh doesn't seem to have any remorse about this. I I I continue to believe that while Neelix is annoying, Tom Paris is certainly bringing a lot of uh, undue pain onto himself and the audience at large, I guess, at this point. Yeah, I'm not totally sure what the game plan is here because, yeah, Paris is – he. not only did he get her a present, he told her how much he paid for it, which yep. is just left the receipt uncouth. right on it. Right on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, <laughs> like it's weird because – Jealous Neelix is kind of weird too because he's he jumps from why is Tom Paris to doing this? Why is Tom Paris doing this to like how many of these crewmen have you fucked? Yeah, I, I like Jealous Neelix actually. Like, I yeah, I don't know. I don't find I find him, I wouldn't say I find him super annoying yet. Like, I, I thought that they, there's this weird space that they're operating in where when he starts going, like, why do you know where all these people are? all these mm-hmm. people live i actually um i don't know i don't know if i thought it was like funny or it was going into a really dark place that i thought was kind of interesting and the show just can't do it because it's a star trek voyager show and i don't know we'll get more into it i suppose as we as we move along but i he, he's the he's he's not as repulsive as i thought he was going to be i don't know if i've acclimated myself to it or something but we'll see before we get into this week's episode which is called Twisted, the sixth episode of the second season. Came out on the 2nd of October, 1995. Teleplay goes to Kenneth Biller. Story credit goes to Arnold Rudnick and Rich Hasek, directed by Kim Friedman. It took three people to write this one, huh? Yeah. Well, one one to write it, two to come up with the idea. Directed by Kim Friedman. In universe date unknown, it's 2371. In this episode, Voyager encounters an inversion field which twists and distorts the ship's hull. Um, it does do all of that. This is another just one of those little factoid <laughs> things. So this is one of the um, this was supposed to be the penultimate ep- season one episode. So it would have been this, and then it would have been the thirty sevens was the original game plan to end out the first mm-hmm. season. Uh, mm-hmm. The thirty sevens was the Amelia Earhart one. So this was going to be the second to last. Clearly a bottle show to save money, um, because. Maybe the biggest downside of it is that it uses existing locations, but in con- in contrary in nature or whatever to the concept of the episode, it doesn't really get weird enough with it. There's no budget to get super weird with what's going on. So right. like the 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 conflict of this episode is that the characters are like, where ah oh, we should have taken a right when we took a left let's go back and then they walk back and they like, wait a minute that was we i thought we came left let's go right and they walk back down the same hallway then they come back and they go where's the bridge where's engineering and then later on in the episode they see a schematic of what the ship looks like and it's like <laughs> it's like this giant pretzel of a of a diagram about what the ship looks like and they're just like well i'll be damned that's that's crazy that that's what that looks like <laughs> and it has no impact whatsoever on where they're going or what they're doing or how the ship looks like uh on the inside yeah that's that's pretty much it yeah yeah no i uh um, walking back and forth i <laughs> i was fairly flabbergasted by how boring this episode was mm. It, it, uh, I found it's it not, less boring than the uh, the last one, the Kim in. Uh, oh yeah, no, I I thought it was way more boring than that. Oh, like, interesting. It, yeah. Well, I guess I would say it's probably on on par because like it's not. It's it's just the crew walking around hallways for an hour, and it, it is. It has and, it has a not, few character moments. I would say that that'll be the, my saving grace when we get to them. But it has a few sort of undercooked character beats that i thought were uh at least somewhat tantalizing yeah i guess but it's like it's not about anything you know it's it's it has the opportunity to be about something but they don't do any they don't go anywhere um you know it's it's not about it's not a uh uh extrapolation of neelix being jealous Uh, you know there's no 
further twisting. It's the twister twisted doesn't take on multiple meanings or anything. It's no. just, it's just yeah. yeah. It's like me walking through a level of Wolfenstein, basically, and I can't remember which way I was, which how I came in, yep. where the secret door was, and I don't know. Yeah, it's just the, the saving grace for me was my new favorite character, who I was convinced was going to be involved somehow in what was going on. Baxter, who, who's the guy, <laughs> Lieutenant like, Baxter. Did you notice the temperature changing? I didn't notice because I was working out like really hard. <laughs> but when I stopped working out really hard, I noticed the temperature had gone way down. That might have been the best thing they've done in the whole show up to this point. <laughs> he's my, I liked him just because he's like, he's the perfect embodiment of like the helpful NPC in a video game sort of yeah. thing. Like he would just, he would pop up and deliver a little bit of information that you needed. And he has this terrific, um, you know, while wailing on his pecs, he didn't realize that the climate control or whatever had gone off the rails. And Kim just Kim just gives him a little bit of the eyebrow when he says that. But he shows up. He's like the glue. He's the same as, um. I forget what episode it was, but there was an episode where, the, oh, it's the one before we have the episode where that crewman gets his face taken by the Vidians. You see that crewman mm-hmm. in an episode before that. And I thought for sure that that crewman was going to amount to something because of the amount of times that the camera found him in the show, yeah. but it didn't. Yeah. And this is the same with Baxter, who apparently has been in the show before, but I don't remember him. And he Could does not, not tell you. No, he does not have anything to do. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I assumed I had never seen him before to my memory. And so the fact that he got multiple scenes with multiple lines. Yeah. Only said to me that he must be involved somehow, but he wasn't. He was just one of the. <laughs> Apparently, the rest of the crew is just a bunch of doughy faced dudes because they were all, <laughs> like they get, when they get to the mess hall, they they talk to a guy who's just like looks like a crew member. They just like a, a film crew member. They just threw yep. into a suit. Um, Baxter at least gets like a Lewis Tully kind of monologue about, you know, leaving, turning his TV on really loud while he's doing a, an exercise at double back at twice at twice the speed. So he, it takes half the time. And he gets a <laughs> workout. Am I am I? um. <laughs> I'm always struck by guest crewmen. Uh, you call them doughy faced. I'm always struck by how their hair is thinning, and I feel like it's something yeah. that I don't see in modern television anymore. Like mm. when a when a random crewman comes on, he's always got a full head of hair in modern gotta Star be, Trek. Got to be a hottie. Gotta yeah, be a hottie. Yeah, that's a lot of the um, a lot of the guest lieutenants from the original '90s shows are are really just uh, kind of average-looking dudes just to come in and have something to say. Their, their hair is starting to go. They're a little bit chubby. It's interesting. Not 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 Christopher Pike-esque pompadours or anything like no. that. No. Well, I just assumed on these shows they don't have the money to hire anybody. Yeah, it's just so a production just, assistant or something. Yeah. yeah, it's just like the catering guy or something. Yeah. I know one of, one of the recurring background um, – lieutenants or whatever was uh beverly crusher's stand-in i think sure. yeah that makes sense yeah you know she pops up a couple times here and there um on tng i mean not on the show but right uh but yeah it's they just kind of pepper the background with pretty normal looking people yep yeah. yeah i don't know man this is just the when it got to the end and it was <laughs> the solution was what if we just let it happen and they let it happen then it just fixes itself i was like you gotta be fucking kidding me <laughs> what, what is what was the point of any of this i you know like if if they had really dug into some stuff because i feel like there was enough characters things that they were hinting at that they could have gotten into the uh what happens when there's misunderstandings between people? Well, isn't it isn't it get... kind of saying that is I I think that what it's trying it's, to say, like on the 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 most surface level touching of it. Yeah, I, I guess that it's a it's a kind of underwhelming resolution to realize that all the things that you thought were problems in this episode are not actually problems, and you can ignore yeah. them. Like that that's kind of what the thing is saying. I I think that's what the takeaway is supposed to be. It's not. It's not super interesting because the episode relies on the whole twisty, twisted nature of like, where are we going? Where have we been? What are we going to do next kind of thing? And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I thought honestly the the weirder twist at the end is when Janeway's like, it's an alien trying to communicate with us. And it's like, that was okay. just, 
that was just they needed to some sci-fi shit to save it. <laughs> that was, that, I, I guarantee you that's all that was. Unless it's the planet from Discovery, though. It's the absorbing, right. yeah. yeah, the absorbing planet. Yeah. Unless uh, I actually thought what I what I actually thought they were going to do is it was going to be like after they passed through the thing, they realized they were like two hundred light years closer to home or something like that. Right. You know what I mean? Like I I was like this has there has to be something they're gaining out of this. And when Torres was like, "We've downloaded, we've downloaded three hundred billion porn, porn ter- <laughs> terabytes of anime from this cloud," <laughs> I was like, "All right, I, I guess it's something. I guess they have to watch the entire run of Dragon Ball sometime. I guess." Yeah, yeah. They weren't even specific about what they got, and I assume that the the cloud took everything that they had. So. It's yeah. like a relationship or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't. It's like a, it's a pretty. This is kind of a weird stretch of the show, I would say. Um, I feel like we've we've had a couple episodes in a row that have been like this. It's just a. I know this is a holdover from the first season, um, and it's kind of clear why they were holding over these episodes. I think because they're not particularly good, uh, and maybe they just wanted to add a little bit of a buffer to the second season, but. Yeah, this is another one that I I feel like the hints of it having something to do about the characters could be there. Like, I, I kind of... Maybe it's the reason that I like Netflix Neelix so much is that <laughs> <laughs> I canceled Netflix. I prefer Neelix. But I, the, I think the reason that I don't hate Neelix and Kess so much at this point is that in a lot of the episodes, their stupidity is kind of the only thing that's going on yeah. in it. So... I'm almost desperate to have it amount to something because at least it's a little bit of intrigue, however badly done it is. You know, in here, I I would prefer that if this episode is focused on the whole Tuvok and Chicote relationship because I feel that they haven't sure. really touched on that in a long time. And this one, I think, is so uh, bland and forgettable, I, I kind of actually have forgotten what they were even disagreeing about <laughs> now that we're talking about it. But they, they disagree about something, and I wish that those two talked more because I like their interactions with each other. Yeah, I didn't remember they had problems with each other until they talked about it for 30 seconds at the yeah. end of the episode. Yeah. But, like, even... <clears throat> excuse me. Even the Neelix stuff uh, becomes moot because Neelix disappears for half the episode. Yeah, yeah, only to, <laughs> inexplicably. Yeah. And then at the end, they're like, "Neelix, where did you go?" And he's like, "I don't have time to tell you. <laughs> Eat this cake." <laughs> they took Janeway off the board, needlessly, I think. And yeah, I, it's it's one of those, you know, it's hinting at character stuff. Like before, Janeway puts her uh, waggly, wavy, floaty, inflatable arm thing into the the twisted uh, mm-hmm. shoot. She's like, Harry, I just have to tell you, I love you. Anyway, on. Yeah, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> it's just, it feels like it's trying to do character stuff, but it, it's really not aligning with where I think that the characters should be in terms of the, the in context of the episode or the series at this point. And I, to get back on track, I think that the show has to refocus itself around the characters yeah. who to this point are. They started off strong in the first season, but now they are fairly interchangeable Lego pieces in a lot of these stories. Mm. And I, I think that's yeah. bad. That's just a bad thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, people kind of start to run together. And I think the, as we talked about in the last episode, um, I think there are signs that they are already running out of ideas for the core concept. Yeah. Well, they love and, spatial and think, anomalies. Is the that's true uh, the other thing? Well, I think one of the things that that is getting in its way is it's trying. We've talked about this before. It's such a novel concept and in a novel setup, but they play it as straight and buttoned up as they do on T and G. Where, like, you know, if ever there was a, sh- a Star Trek show where people should be a lot more informal with each other, it's probably this one. Yeah, because as the uh, relationships change and start breaking down, being stuck out there so long, you, you would assume things would get a little bit uh, different and a little weird. But they just play it like it's just TNG again. And it's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And I don't think it works in an episode like this where you've got scenes where every character on the show is together and they're just shouting techno shit at each other yeah they have nothing to talk about is the problem <clears throat> yeah yeah and i mean they should have plenty to talk about like yeah. 
like we're saying, they have they have these bits of character things where they can do stuff that seems like it's almost interesting, but they don't go to they don't go far enough with it, and so you end up having everybody in, in the pool hall just talking about like phase inducers and stuff, and it's yep. just I don't know, it's just it is it's nothing about this episode was engaging to me really, and at, at the least, except I want to know what that guy's putting up on the bench because. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was pushing so hard he did not notice a 10 degree temperature drop in the room so you know he's putting up plates and i want to know how much next episode on voyager star trek voyager lieutenant baxter was he working out with that other guy was he working out with that dude who was who was in his underwear <laughs> the freshly showered asian man yes. I, I would <laughs> That guy, what a stoic reaction to just people barging in where he just stood there, didn't didn't cover up, didn't do anything, just stood there mm-hmm. as... Uh, as Belana Torres had a... I don't, like, it's just kind of one of those weird things. I know that they're trying to make something happen there, but she has a reaction that's almost as if she had been pining for this guy for the past season and a half, and she walked in on yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. It's strange. Yeah, it is, it is weird. It, it's like... It is that kind of reaction because if it's not that kind of reaction, it's the kind of reaction where she just like walked in on someone who was completely nude. Mm-hmm. And this guy was like, he had a, sh- a towel over his shoulder and he was wearing shorts. So he yeah. was not like <laughs> scandal- scandalously undressed or anything. This is the puritanical 90s, Clay. So this is extremely yeah, er- erotic stuff that we're seeing on our television <laughs> sets. Yeah. It's, did I think you know it's, HBO? Did you know HBO Max does not have any episodes of real sex on it? Oh, uh, that was like the staple of everybody's. That's the only reason people watch HBO until The Sopranos started. <laughs> now they're that, they're just embarrassed of it now. Yeah, too many old people on horses riding each other like horses. And <laughs> that was strange. Real things. sex was the was the greatest bait and switch in the history of cable television. It was because you know you're you're a teenager. You see that's on next. You go, oh man, we're gonna see some some hot stuff and then it's always like <laughs> 60 year old nudists who are doing like magic tricks with their scrotums yep. and stuff <laughs> and, and still we watched <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> you know I, this is not what i came for but i'm enjoying what, I, what i've gotten that's funny mm-hmm. i wonder if there's any other hbo shows that aren't on hbo max that they would have i wonder why it must be some kind of rights disagreement Maybe. or something i know uh tales from the crypt isn't isn't on there and mm. that's been that's been famously in limbo for many years because of rights reasons. Like yeah. it only they only ever put it out on DVD. Um, Not Blu-ray. It's been, you mean? It's, no, it's never been out on Blu-ray. It's been out of print for a long time. I think yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think you can stream it anywhere e- either. Yeah, the guy who owned it just went to the to the grave. He's like Satoshi or something like that. <laughs> um, to get another Bitcoin reference in uh, in two in a row, um, twisted. Well. It is. I mean, it's not. It's not even really anything to talk about. Like Shea Fook that they find themselves in again. Like they're all there. They can't <laughs> leave it. Um, I wanted to see. You know what? This they should have had. This was such a boring episode. They needed a scene where Werewolves of London starts playing and the Doctor just totally hustles Fake Kramer <laughs> on the on the pool table, like the color of money. That would have been amazing. I, I would have I would have taken a break to watch the 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 Doctor, uh, uh, it, exceptionally and very uh, intricately d- dismantle a pool table and and destroy this guy. <laughs> I I I could do with that montage. I thought what I also thought was interesting is that um. It sort of played with my emotion, like you know how how often the the um, the franchise tries to do a am I I'm not human but am I a person kind of stories with data mm-hmm. and the the holographic doctor and stuff like that, um, and some of them work, some of them don't. But when when the fake Kramer came over and and was like, hey Tom Paris, do you want to shoot around a pool? And Paris just goes fuck yourself and just walks <laughs> off. I was I was so hurt for that hologram. I was like the hologram's just trying to do what his, his programming tells him to do. But apparently yeah, he's Tom just Paris had he, other mind. He's just that NPC that has to get the game going. Like, yeah, you know, you're standing around in, in the pub not doing anything, <laughs> and it just comes over and is like, "Would you like me to tell you about the information that I have? Would you like to be hustled in pool? Press A for yes." Yeah, um, I mean, to, to I guess to examine why the concept itself doesn't work, an astounding amount of this is 
a character goes, where are we? And another character walks up to a door and reads something that we cannot read as the audience. And they go, yes. this is not where this door should be. <laughs> and we go, really? Like, I don't, I don't know anything about that. Because obviously they're limited. They have, they have an eight foot long corridor, right, that they can work in and mm-hmm. shoot all this stuff. And none of it looks different. It's all exactly the same thing because it's exactly the same set. And it's just, it's, unless they can do dramatic things like this is not the bridge and it's clearly not the bridge it's really just kind of this pointless exercise of re- of reading hotel room numbers on the walls and yeah it's, it's so silly yeah it was um it was dumb yeah i i do have to say uh torres and paris put a lot of faith in that transporter after all the other shit that was going on, they were like, let's try the transporter out. And luckily oh. they didn't get, you know, Brundle flied. Yeah. <laughs> can't, you can't send a, a voicemail to anybody, but you can move your entire existence across the, uh, the ship. Ben- I did have, I did identify um, with the people in Shefuk when um, uh, Tuvok first radios down and the thing starts breaking up. Yeah. I was like, that's. Every time I tried to take a cell phone call in the car in, my, in the year 2000, eventually that would happen. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah, Tuvok still remains semi, semi-solid semi in, in terms of what he had. To, he doesn't have much to do here, but it, it was fine for what he is. I liked his uh, his command style with Harry Kim. Yeah. It was very Ebenezer Scrooge-esque yeah. with a little bit less dickishness behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I... There's not much else really behind him. Uh, I'm sorry. This is, this is a very disjointed episode, but I guess it's thematically fitting. The I thought the absolute worst scene was um, Harry and Bolana when they're trying to get the the shock wave from the warp core or whatever, and he's mm-hmm. going like ten, nine, <laughs> just <laughs> screaming at each other as the they're doing the countdown. I thought that was a really terrible, terrible scene. Yeah, man, scene. it's more. People standing over computers and and yelling stuff, yeah. trying to generate drama out of it, and it's just like, uh, this is the best you got. Come on, yeah, yeah. All right, well, I guess we're done with this one. It's another another fairly poor episode, so we'll move to patron thoughts. Patreon.com slash the Penske file. If you want to support the show, leave your thoughts. We read them, and if you're a captain tier, we shout out your name to the heavens. We say thank you to Ben Douglas Tark. Tark Latif, Andrew Boudreau, Christian Boudreau, Joint Mango, Kyle Barrett, Mike Burnett, Matthew Ross, Michael Pond, Matt Cutler, Nick Sergi, Sean Bradley, Killens, Brendan Neil Howells, Vault 13 Hero, Dwayne Hackett, Kevin Reyes, Jordan Cooper, Russell Ellis, Stephen Minton, HH28, Darth Moss, Derek <laughs> Zajak, Paul Roscoe, Jake123, Patrick Seba, Dave Davies, Point Extra G, Barry Wallace, Jimmy Crow, Captain Brazen, Eric St. Juan, Jaka Gemur, William Scheisler, Rahan Jaffer, Nick the Rat, Zane Majors, Olivia Pardieu, Grapple John Zorn, Tom Hickey, Captain Gunchazen, Tommy Tango, and Cash, Jonas, Two Vicks Must Die, Disbrode, Chris McLaughlin, Royo, Admiral Nakamura, Clef they, them, Ed Mark Star, Jeremy Boudreau, J Man, the Undiscovered Mugato, Robbie Duffield, Will Clay, Atanga Boudreau, Artorius, Zayla Maru, Jaron Hatch, and John Aylman. Thanks, everybody, for leaving your thoughts. And some of those thoughts we're going to read right now. So I'll start off with this first one here. Tax Owl Bear says, Twisted, once more an episode with a setup more interesting than the resolution, but as they say, Everyone can write the first part of the world's most interesting story, only for it to be saved by an Adobe After Effects filter. <laughs> it was a hell of a filter, though. It's one of my favorites to use on all of our podcast video content. Norman Buckwald says this. You can read it. This is an interesting, underrated story that seems to be very TNG-like in its story of an unusual anomaly and its effect on the ship. Liked the choice at the end to do nothing, believe it or not. Also, one of the rare instances that should have been more common, Chakotay and Tuvok at odds as to how to handle the ship in a crisis. Downside, of course, is Neelix and his petty jealousy. Four Jebelian fudge cakes out of five. <clears throat> you know, I actually, I don't mind the do-nothing thing because that is kind of like, I think that works if the rest of your episode isn't nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you if know, it's a lot like of overthought. You mean like su- like super thinking about the problem, and then it, it just kind of solves itself. Yeah, yeah, because like everything that they tried was, I never felt like things got out of hand or like tensions got to a boiling point or anything. And so this idea that oh maybe they just chill out and you know 
let yeah. it happen, man. Yeah, it just doesn't. I don't. I don't think it. It lands the way that it could if if uh, if it had been <laughs> the story had been told differently. Yeah, I would. I. I I would agree with that. I think that there's a. I think you can thematically, if they were ever interested in going back to the Maquis and Starfleet schism, I think that this is another episode that can ride that line a little bit, where it's a, mm-hmm. you know, you think you have a problem between the two groups, but it turns out like, just everyone taking a step back and taking a breather fixes things. It's like right. you're, you're getting right. too heated and you're overthinking it and you're getting crazed, and that's causing all the problems. But if you just relax and go with it. <laughs> um <Yeah. laughs> then it works out for you. Um what was his other his so I guess this is a good enough point. Norman brings up this is very TNG like. Um I I was trying to think of this is a TNG setup, but I was trying to put my finger on why TNG in my estimation, I and mean, maybe this is a lot of rose tinted glasses and stuff and personal favorites. I felt like TNG usually did a better job of these episodes in some way. I I don't know what it is, but I feel like Enterprise and Voyager episodes tend to have sci-fi plots that feel kind of... They're unique in how they miss the mark as an episode of television. Like I feel like when TNG failed at this kind of a thing... It was usually a failure in terms of their execution of what they thought the episode was about, really. Mm -hmm. And Voyager and Enterprise seem to be perfectly content a lot of the time to just have an idea and sort of futz around with the sci-fi idea for a little bit and then make up an ending to wrap it all up. Yeah. I feel like TNG just did it better than these shows do, but I don't know if that's me being biased. Yeah, I mean, I think you can just tell because I I had a lot of the same complaints with Enterprise, where it was like the shows aren't about anything; they're just about whatever the plot is, and that's not enough. Um, especially when you've got so many other shows, Star Trek, so many other shows within the Star Trek franchise that handle that stuff better. Mm. Like you know, DS Nine was really good at it. Um, TNG was really good at it and it's just it, it I I feel like it is in Star Trek specifically it really stands out because there's such a, a great history of um considered science fiction that it are about there's plot and there's a plot and then there's a story yeah you know and 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 the two end up working pretty well together whereas when it's just the plot, I feel like it just really stands out um, in a Star Trek show. I wonder if in terms of the franchise and our own personal journey with the podcast, too, I, I, I certainly am at a point where now that this is our last Star Trek series, believe it or not, really, because yeah. I don't consider the animated series, but we're, we're at the end of a tremendous amount of television. And now when episodes start and the hook hits in, I go, oh, it's one of these episodes, you know? Mm-hmm. And... I know that always happened throughout the other series, but I think at this point it's like really uh, the plots can become really redundant in a way. So if Voyager chooses to just go with the sci-fi, the ship is going through some kind of weird change. If there's not a Voyager specific story stuck onto it, it 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 it's never going to land in a way that will make me think that it's a memorable episode because I've yeah. seen this before, you know. <clears throat> yeah, especially in Voyager where we're two seasons in and they've used giant space anomalies like six times. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so it's like, you've got a couple layers of, okay, uh, well, it's another space anomaly. Okay. What's this one going to be up? Oh, okay. It makes the ship weird. All right. What's the next thing? Yeah. Well, that, that's it. That's as far as it goes. And yep. I think like you said, the budget doesn't allow it to get interestingly weird enough. I think if, if they had really been able to do something cool visually, yeah, maybe that takes a lot of weight off the shoulders of the rest of it. But even so, it's like I feel like this setup is built for writers. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's built to literally twist these characters through character things. I mean, that's what bottle episodes do. Yeah, the, the good bottle episodes are character conflict episodes. They're not action or plot episodes. Yeah, so it's it's unfortunate that they couldn't, uh, you know couldn't wring anything out of this one 
Yeah, see, I mean, with the the title and the what's happening to the ship, it does feel like it's one of those. Um, it's like a naked now. Everyone's personality is a little bit twisted too, mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. Like you could see that, but they they didn't do it. Cal- not a single bottle of hard iced tea or lemonade anywhere. No, haven't seen those ads in a long time. They still sell twisted tea, right? I think that's still a thing. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Cal Barrett says twisted. I enjoy the first 15 minutes of this one, but the disorientation of the shifting locations is initially quite effective, but it's not an idea that can carry an entire episode, and it soon grows incredibly tiresome, like a Discord conversation about Three Mile Island. Most of the episode is just a pair of characters walking down the corridor, saying the same thing over and over. There's startlingly little escalation for something that's supposed to be closing in. And why do they call the anomaly a ring as if it's a two-dimensional thing, and uh, as if it is two-dimensional and they can just fly over it? Kest is now two and rapidly becoming too old for Neelix's taste, who once again acts like a jealous prick, although this time they write him like Data as if he's never experienced emotions before. I just want to punch him in the face or at least cut his <laughs> disgusting eyebrows. Two, story to- two, two Toy Story 3 endings of holding hands and accepting death out of five. I um, that w- Go ahead. I, just, I, I enjoyed the Three Mile Island uh, conversation on Discord. I would just say that... Um, you know, Cal, it's just Cal's a, a, zoom, a zoomer who thinks the world will be powered by TikTok videos or something like that. But it's not the case. We have to it's just a name. Things. It was actually a peninsula. That's right. It's, <laughs> it's not actually a killing floor at all. I did. Uh, um, I did think it was weird that they wrote that Neelix didn't understand the concept of jealousy. <laughs> that was very strange. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess he. I mean. Am I misremembering? Or, to be fair, he is sort of curious about how other people react to it, right? Or that other people experience that as well. I get. I because he talks to Chicote about it. He's like, "Do you ever get jealous?" Yeah, I. My recollection of it is that it's more like he's never felt it before, so he doesn't understand it. Oh, but okay. I could be. I could be wrong. It, you could. Be, it could be just more what you're saying. Because I think he has he has conversations with Kess where he's like, "I know I'm." I'm not being that guy. I'm not yeah. doing that again. It's yeah. it's this kind of a thing. He also um, is very complimentary to Chakotay's uh, uh, appearance. He's like, Commander, you must get laid all the time. Look at you. <laughs> you strapping Chakotay Indian face. Chakotay gives that like half answer that really means actually no, not very often. <laughs> yeah, I, I, get, I get laid all the time. I do. I do okay. <laughs> That that should have been that. That's the twisted episode that I want to say. Neelix finds Chakotay's hidden camera video collection. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look behind the wardrobe. Woodrow says twisted, better than your cliche. Oh, sorry. I'll send this to you just to keep up our little um, our little game here and keep your. Keep your muscles intact. I don't want you to fall behind Baxter in the the workout department. <laughs> Better than your cliche calamity, yet regrettably not adventurous enough to be truly interesting. Never, nevertheless, the peril of this non-toxic, non explodey anomaly sets the stage for five minutes of strong character growth. From the Doctor's not-so-hollow embrace of Kess to Tuvok's near-embrace slash nerve pinch of Janeway, in their final moments, we get to know our crew. A solid three dimensions out of five. That actually... <laughs> If if the end of this episode, what we learned is that everybody just has the hots for Kess, I would have been more happy with it. <laughs> because now it's it's Neelix, Paris, the Doctor, and I like I kind of wish everybody else was kind of hot for her too, just yeah. for the hell of it. Yeah, just, <laughs> it's that atmosphere, Shefuk. It's just extremely erotic. You know, Torres is <laughs> is going through the Jeffries tube with her, and then out of nowhere, she's like, "You know, Kess, I've I've never, but I would." <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the, she's just like, what are you talking about? Can I? <laughs> with the with the Tuvok scene that he's referencing, where Tuvok's like touches Janeway's shoulder or puts his hand on the chair next to her, he should have just continued to just cop the feel and just came back <laughs> up. <laughs> just in the moments before death, this is this are the things that are important. Did you um, like I'm, I'm laughing about I like there are these sort of undeserved moments of stuff like that. Like I like that Tuvok moment where he looks down at Janeway before the green beam of death doesn't do anything to him. Mm-hmm. It's got it's got little things like that. It's just not obviously it's not nearly enough. Yeah, it's just not 
none of it's particularly earned. Like yeah. literally, m- literally, it just kind of comes out of nowhere yeah. when they need it to, and it's just yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, it none of it feels natural to the story of the episode, which to me didn't really exist at all. Yes. So yeah. everything feels really random. Point next to G says, I'm sorry, Captain, we lost Neelix. Yeah, that didn't land with the viewers like they wanted it to. At least this week, he realized that he was on, uh, he was being a douche nozzle and tried to do something about it. Everyone lost on the ship and being pulled back to the holodeck makes for a great premise, but I don't know if the mechanics of what was happening make a whole lot of logistical sense. I did like the realization at the end that they all they could all that all they could do is let it happen and hope that it works out. Eric McGowan is the next person in line. And there you go. If I can ever defend a completely random and seemingly maligned episode, it would be this one. For an episode that just has the cast walking back and forth, Twisted has some great character work going on. The overarching plot is fine, and the different approaches to the ca- uh, sorry, the different approaches the characters have to an inevitable and unwinnable situation are interesting. Four out of five. Wow. All right. Brendan Neil Howell says, Twisted, a good idea that goes on too long. Finally, Chakotay has the balls to disagree with Tuvok. Down points for the amorous hologram and Neelix's jealousy. Why does every festival have to be from Earth? Three Janeway saying, it's talking to me. Do nothing out of five. Kensito is the next person here. Oh, I copied a little date. Hopefully this comes through okay. It did. It just put the date at the bottom. Is this the most boring episode in the franchise? No, that honor belongs to the alternative factor from TOS, if only because that episode is 15 minutes longer. Nevertheless, watching the Voyager crew wander around aimlessly gets old really, really quickly, and only the conversation between Chakotay and Tuvok lifts the rest of the episode. One candid conversation out of five. Very split opinions on this one. Surprisingly yeah. to me, doesn't seem like um, doesn't seem like the kind of episode that would do that, but it is. Grappler John Zorn says, Twisted, so another spatial anomaly that I guess knows stuff. Huh. Another two out of five. Yeah, it's the, uh, this is the two out of five season, I think, uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately. So to, to potentially alleviate a little bit of your concerns, Clay, I guess the second season is pretty legendary for being a step down from the first one. Um, the show recovers a bit after this, but it is supposed to be mm-hmm. a bad season. This is Jonathan J.K. Morris. Oh, sorry. I didn't see it. Uh, I thought you were like signing off from a radio station or something. <laughs> this is Jonathan signing J.K. Off. Morris signing off. <laughs> Stay tuned for Chuchy and the Bear. Sorry, I didn't. I, I Drive didn't, time radio. <laughs> I didn't remind you to come up with your, <clears throat> your radio uh, sign off nickname, unfortunately. <laughs> it's cool the alien didn't want to hurt them. I'm happy for the crew. It's an empty, happy ending mirroring what happens in season five's course oblivion. But maybe don't spoil it for Clay if he does remember my mention of it now. <laughs> and you re- you read the comment just fittingly, but you I'm sure you will uh, obviously remember this. One forty five one forty five minute misdirection out of five. <clears throat> Benjamin Espinosa. I'm, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to remember any of that. So I've already worry. I've already forgotten. I know he said season five. Benjamin Espinosa says twisted. This mystery of the week episode is one that I quite liked. It had an Alice in Wonderland vibe with the crew left quite helpless and lost in a bad dream. The sci-fi angle seemed all over the place, but it did manage some nice character moments, including Tuvok reaching for Janeway in his final moments. And the running tension between the crew was evident as Chakotay bristled at Tuvok, and he he capitalized bristled, so it clearly means business. Three out of five from Benjamin. Aaron Millian is the next person in line. Amelie, 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 Amelie. Go ahead. I keep thinking that Neelix can't get more annoying only to be disappointed at the next episode. His Tom Paris jealousy obsession slash jealousy obsession has started to mar the season for me. Nice scene with Janeway and Kim in the Jeffries tube. I also like Chakotay finally becoming more assertive. Three anomalous birthday cakes out of five. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess it's, I guess the, the best takeaway from it is that Chakotay kind of asserts himself a little bit. But he does, yeah. I don't know. Not That's interestingly, fine. but he d- he does do it. I think. Um, do you have any thought? I don't know if you said. Did you say thoughts about your the Neelix and Kess situation? Where you stand on it now at this point? Um, I don't. I don't know because I. I'm I'm not sure because the 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 jealousy stuff. Like, I, I think par the Paris angle is very weird. Yeah. Um. But 
it makes sense that Neelix would be jealous of that, but at the same time, the way that he's like, how come you know where everybody sleeps? Are you just <laughs> hanging out in all these guys' rooms at night? That that stuff is a bit much. It's, I, a, it's a college relationship <clears throat> conversation. between. I, right. I, I love how childish it is, is my favorite thing about it, yeah. How does he know where the bathroom is? You said he's never been here before. <laughs> yeah, like it's uh, that's that might be a bit much. I think there's enough to chew on with the Paris stuff as as weird and kind of forced as it is. Is Paris um, willing? Is Paris aware of what he's doing? I have no idea. He I mean, has to be. Right? He has to be. Yeah. Like they when? Let's say he's not. He's just when an idiot have, at this point. So they've re they've recharacterized him as. Not the Han Solo character, but just kind of an idiot, a bumbling buffoon. Well, I was going to say, when has he? When have he and Kess spent enough time together mm. to warrant any of the the what any of the attention that he's giving her? Like, if they were buddies that hung out a lot, maybe you might be able to say, like, oh, well, he's just he's just got her a birthday present. Oh, he just you know helped her carry stuff to the mess, you know. But they you, you get no inclination that they are friends. Yeah. So it just seems like he's kind of hitting on her. And if he's not aware of it, then, like, I guess he just doesn't know his own magnetism. Yeah, I just I think Star Trek won't write a character to be that sort of subversive, you know, to be aware that there's the relationship and still trying to do something there. They haven't commented on it at all. I think one of the... What I think is one of the weirdest decisions about it and what makes it the most irritating to watch is that... Neelix is not a character where perceived jealousy or perceived infidelity is possible to have any kind of serious ramifications for any other crew member. You know, like, mm-hmm. if if he was a dangerous character, there's something there to it, you know, because his, sure, his yeah. misconceptions can lead to bad actions. But Neelix is just a pussy. Basically, you know, like there's no, he's just going to complain to Chicote and the doctor and Tuvok about stuff. That's, that's the only thing he can do and yell at Kess. And he's mm-hmm. so unthreatening that even Kess is like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, there's like no, there's no danger to the situation. So it just comes across as him bitching all the time, which is probably the most tiresome aspect of it. It feels like the, the math that Paris did in his head was going yeah, he'd probably still watch. Yeah. <laughs> it should be it's sleeping with the enemy is the Julia um Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts movie, right? Yeah. Where the guy's mm-hmm. like he's her controlling husband is like out and he's like they live on a lake and like their neighbor comes up and he's like Hey, he's like, your house is great. And he's like, you're so such a lucky man to have such a beautiful wife. And he's like, thank you. And then he goes home and beats her. He's like, why is he looking at you that way? It's, it's that yeah. kind of a thing. Like they, they need something like that where Kess is trying to get away from him, but there's just, he's so pathetic as a character that it's just, it doesn't amount to anything. Yeah. Laura, I mean, she can't I mean, swim. I don't think we need to turn him into a wife. <laughs> and do a domestic abuser, but I understand what you're saying. I think we need to, I do think we need some some kind of spite. Hey, Sleeping with the Enemy is an interesting movie. It's pretty ne- good. Yeah. Neelix the character, not so interesting. How do I well, there we go. I did it. Change link says twisted. I do not mind science problem based Star Trek episodes, but I feel like you need a strong emotional core to make them interesting. And all we get is a jealous Neelix, a horny barmaid, and Twin Peaks backwards talk. Also, what was that bumpkin crewman? Why does he need to ask Harry if it's a good idea to be at his station during a crisis? I miss Durst. I like a bit of the animosity between Chakotay and Tuvok, though. Editors note, Durst was the guy that got his face ripped off in faces. Spidey fans, Excelsior. Two dripping wet Asian men fresh out of the shower, out of five. He's got to know if he can get some squats in before his next round. Yeah. He's got to know. Is it it me or is it swollen here? (laughs) Artorias says the next one. A rather forgettable episode about a rather generic plot premise that simply fills the void of weekly entertainment. Except I wasn't really entertained and found myself really not caring about anything, minus my curiosity on how that cake would actually taste if that was an actual cake. (laughs) The gym is going to need to stay open a little longer to burn off all that fudge. Two clogged arteries out of five. Oh, yeah. Cardio for Baxter all week after that, that 
succulent. That's not succulent. I can't think of the word. That delicious <laughs> cake. Jaron Hatch says, remember that part with the characters slowly walking down a hallway and the part where different characters walk down another hallway but with tricorders? And then the part where the first characters found the other characters walking down the same hallway? Oh, and that one time where all the characters argued about nothing and then stood around and waited for a thing to happen? I remember, like Pepperidge Farm. Come I, on, that's like that's like every episode of Seinfeld. Uh, one barely awake staff writer out of five. Matt Ross is the next if one. They had, if they had been transporting a specific kind of loaf of bread, you'd think it was the best episode <laughs> you've ever seen. Matt Ross, go ahead. An interesting idea for an alien encounter, but the episode has the worst of the Neelix. The ship is at emergency, and he wants to know who's going to eat cake. Neelix is je- jealous of Tom, despite Kess promising mating privileges, although it's really bad form to make Tom look... So, oh, sorry, one second. Although it's really bad form for Tom to make a locket for someone else's girlfriend and then announce how much it costs. Mm-hmm. The Chakotay and Tuvok ch- chafing bit. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> the, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> still chafing. stuck in the gym. Stuck in the gym. Get powdered down. <laughs> Uh, the Chicote and Tuvok chaffing was a bit ridiculous as Chicote already agreed to be XO and Tuvok is a rule following Vulcan. Three weirdness washing over us out of five. Royo says, Twisted, this episode was famously considered the worst episode of Star Trek at the time until Threshold would claim the crown for itself. Although having rewatched some of the TNG season one recently, this episode is quite inoffensive, all things considered. I can get what this one tried to do, to make a bottle episode out of Voyager turning into a labyrinth. The problem is using an anomaly to do that makes no sense. The Doctor actually provides a sensible plot solution, and the crew are hallucinating like Johnny Depp hopped up on the devil's ether in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. But no, the anomaly has physically twisted Voyager into a labyrinth. At least I find the bizarreness of the episode somewhat engaging. Two out of five. I, yeah, I wouldn't say this is one of the the worst ever. It's like it's come. On, there's plenty more episodes that are just bad. Yeah, well, this is this is just boring and inoffensive, really. Yeah, I, I kind of like the last one. I mean, it's going to be my. It's sort of my final thoughts. Said early is that what Voyager hasn't done so far is embarrassed itself really. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think that the episode needs to embarrass itself to re- hit that one level, but. Voyager might be impervious to it in the same way that Enterprise kind of was because they're not actually trying in a lot of the episodes so far. And this is harsh because we did like the first season, but we've, we've just seen a string of bad episodes in a row. So this, this stretch is what feels like that to me. Yeah. Uh, I sent this to you. This is Clef, they, them. An anomaly leaves no systems responding and the crew ends up lost and desponding. The actors are asleep and the budget is cheap, but it's nice to see characters bonding. Two phenomena, do 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 do, out of five phenomena, do 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 do. Hey, nicely done. Latte Librarian says, "Twisted. It's a weird little episode, but I liked it. Something cozy about everyone gathered in a bar, waiting for the unknown." And then final comments from Jonas. My name is Jonas, and it sends it to you. Man, was this boring. It almost made me prefer you. Eulogium? I think it's Eulogium. He put a U in there, but I think it's just Eulogium. Eulogium is a cream for a certain kind of rash. Yeah, and how you uh, wish you were someone was delivering, delivering your Eulogium after watching two of these episodes <laughs> in a row. <laughs> Tuvok is excellent as usual, especially in his interactions with Chakotay in this episode. Janeway continues to surprise with her very credible natural acting, as she did here in the Jeffrey's Tube with Kim. Picardo, his newsies hat, is adorable. Otherwise, this episode was eminently forgettable. Two out of five. Thanks, patrons, for leaving your thoughts about Twisted, which has got us all twisted up with your incredible spread of scores here. We have fours all the way down to ones. So... Thanks very much. Patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show and leave comments. Clay, what are you going to give this one? Although I think I can guess based on some comments here about how it relates to previous episodes. But what are you going to say straight from the horse's mouth? Uh, two. Yeah, it's another two, right? Yeah. Long string of twos mm-hmm. that we've been on. Long string of twos. Like <laughs> you've just <laughs> had Mexican food for breakfast. <laughs> A lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of, yeah, the two, the, I mean, there's a, 
Neelix is concerned about being number two. Tuvok is unaware of who should be second in command. Two is in his name. Yeah. Sloppy seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything else too related. There's a lot to do. So we'll get to the end. Thanks, everybody. That's it. I'm going to give it a two as well. I think these are all these have all been twos, I think, in the second season so far, and we're six episodes in. So that's a hell of a thing. You uh, know, you know what's what's so much like really goes to show you how um like ultimately kind of emasculated Tuvix not Tuvix Tuvix or <clears throat> Neelix how, so. <laughs> how <laughs> emasculated <laughs> Neelix is sure. by this whole situation is he he's getting up in her in her shit being like why do you know where this guy's room is and she doesn't even take the bait like she's like completely oblivious to why he's mad about it he's yeah. like i just know where his room is she's What's over it yeah, like she doesn't, she doesn't even like really call him out for being a jealous dickhead. No, which is which is almost worse, isn't it? Like if you were, if you were a jealous boyfriend, and your girlfriend, or a jealous anybody, girlfriend or boyfriend, and your partner was responding that way, yeah, you'd almost feel like they were gaslighting you to a certain extent. Like, wouldn't you want them to? respond be like what are you talking about that's crazy don't be jealous blah 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 blah. but she's just like no i just know where he where he sleeps no it's it's disrespectful in some ways like she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't notice and she doesn't respond to how much this is upsetting him and it's you're in a weird spot because he's being unreasonable here it's like it's just it's fascinating to me that the show is so skillfully avoiding turning it into a conflict you know, yeah. like they, there's there they have all the material in line. They have all the conversations that should lead it to something, but it, it ends up just never amounting to anything because of the reactions from the other character involved. It's weird. And she's two years old. She's DTF. Yeah, she is. <laughs> she's she's old for she's old for these. They, someone has a line. Oh yeah, Neelix is the line of the story. He's like you're two, but you don't look a day over one and a half, and everyone laughs. That's good. I don't know. Still, still creepy to me. I don't even know if they break up before she leaves the show, so that'll be interesting. Yeah. How? When does she leave? Uh, season four. Yeah. You know, I still so far like I prefer her over Neelix personally. I, I yeah, don't, she's fine. Yeah, I think she's. I don't find anything particularly wrong with her character. No. Um, and Neelix is. He's he's a different tone that I don't think quite lands the way they want it to. Yeah. Neelix doesn't have a counterpart that's come before, right? There's no character that's kind of like him. Um, mm. No, yeah, I don't not, think. Not really. No. And no character. I guess the closest is like Quark. Yeah. But it's not quite the same. Quark has an edge, though. Yeah. Yeah, maybe he is kind of similar to... well. Yeah, Quark. I, I I think DS Nine just did a better job of like Quark isn't my favorite character, but Quark is at least important to the concept of what DS Nine is. Like, mm-hmm. there's a reason that he exists. Yeah, Neelix doesn't have that. Yeah, and I it's weird to to say that I prefer Cass because honestly, she serves no real purpose. No, she doesn't. But neither does Neelix really. Yeah, and I, I think he's just louder about it, <laughs> so it stands out more. Thanks, everybody, for listening, supporting the show, patreon.com slash Lipensky file. We'll be back next week with whatever episode is next. I've given up on using memory alpha because it's it's too confusing with all these holdovers. Clay, do you have anything you want to say before we go? Yeah, my uh, issue of Batman White Knight Red Hood that I co-wrote with Sean Murphy is now in comic book stores. So if you wanted to grab one of those, I'd be much obliged. And uh, Amanda and I are still... Making our way through the second string of Stephen King. In July, we had Maximum Overdrive. August, we'll be doing Sometimes They Come Back. And then uh, I got a couple more until December when we hit the 1990 version of Stephen King's It, which I'm very excited about talking about. Is Red Hood <clears throat> just out physically? Because I looked on Amazon and it wasn't out yet. It wasn't available to buy. Uh, as of this recording, it is not out anywhere yet. It comes out 
uh, this coming Tuesday. Of, oh, I see. You're t- you're, yeah. you're so you're you're planning ahead. Okay, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. So whenever this episode is out, the the com- the comic will be out yes, by that point. That, that that makes sense to me. It, it, uh, I looked the other day and I, it was saying it was a week away or whatever. So that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's it. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you for supporting the show, all that stuff. And we will be back with the next episode of Star Trek. I think it's part or something like that, but that's my guess. Thanks everybody. We will see you later.